Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our public plenary uh, series. Um, I'm Stephanie Russell. I'm the Georgia Municipal Association's Economic Development Manager and Program Manager for Georgia Economic Placemaking, Co Placemaking Collaborative. Um, we are here today as part of a new series that we added to our Georgia Economic Placemaking Collaborative uh, program, as well as in partnership with Georgia City Solution, which is Georgia Municipal Association's nonprofit organization. So we're so excited to be here and to have um, uh, our guest speaker today. And I want to give a great introduction to Chris Clark. Uh, Chris is a Georgia native, and he has served as the president and CEO of the Georgia Chamber of Commerce since 2010. He received his bachelor's degree from Georgia State University and his master's degree from Georgia College and State University. Prior to joining the Georgia Chamber, Chris served as a commissioner of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources and as a deputy commissioner for the Department of Economic Development, among other positions. Chris Clark is a graduate of Leadership Georgia and has been consistently named one of the most influential Atlantans and Georgians. Chris and his wife Tiffany and their son Christian live in Peachtree City and attend Dogwood, Dogwood Church. Chris, it is such a pleasure to have you and we are so excited to hear your presentation. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks for having me today. Appreciate the opportunity to, to spend a little time with my fellow economic developers around the state. Always a pleasure to be with you guys. And Talking about an issue today that I hope that, that if you're not passionate about it yet, that, that you will become passionate about it. Um, you know, in economic development, we're used to dealing with water lines and roads and sewer and industrial parks and, and placemaking in our downtowns. But I think more and more and more over the last 15 years, the issue of talent development, inclusion, empowerment, equality, have really become, I believe, just as important as part of the infrastructure for economic development, growth, and prosperity than anything else. You know, years ago, I, I worked on a project, and the, the project leader on it said at the end of the day, he goes, listen, we can find an industrial park anywhere in the world. Uh, we can find water, sewer, anywhere in the world. We can find ports in this many countries. It was, but what we're really looking for are, is a community where we want to be part of the community. Uh, and where there's an inclusion, a diversity of thought, uh, of age, of demographics, where it really works together. And I think that's really what's driving most economic growth today is this idea of where can I go to get the best talent. So about six or seven years ago, the Georgia Chamber started looking at what talent was going to look like a generation from now. And we really focused on Gen Z. We really focused on the changing demographics of Georgia. And many of you probably heard our talks before, really letting Georgians know that we are moving to become a majority minority state very quickly. Uh, that Generation Z is a very different generation than what we've had before. Uh, millennials are different still than, than Generation X, my generation. Um, and that we need to, to be thoughtful in our policy making and our strategies at the local and state level about all of these issues. And so we were making a lot of progress, I think, over the last several years. And obviously, we got to this past summer uh, where we had, a, a, you know, a social unrest that was justified, needed to happen in the country. Part of what psychologists tell us is the reason that it was so effective in June and July of this year of raising the attention of inequality is because COVID actually made us all a little more empathetic. Now, it's hard to imagine that today with political polarization, but at the time when you're at home and you can watch videos of what's happening in real time to someone, when you can listen and really understand the numbers, what people are going through, I do think it was an awakening. And it was an awakening for a lot of our businesses to do more in this space of equality for opportunity, more on inclusion, more on empowerment. And we're seeing companies invest left and right, and we're seeing companies make this more of a priority for their shareholders and their own employees. So here at the Georgia Chamber, we've been out meeting with communities for several years now and helping them understand really the inequalities, um, some of the systemic racism issues that each community in Georgia faces. And those are difficult conversations to have and I know a lot of you are having those conversations. But this presentation I'm gonna share with you today was really built to raise awareness at the local level to help business leaders understand that 
this is not just some esoteric argument that there are real numbers behind the inequality that some Georgians face, but to really use COVID-19 as a way to frame this issue, because I think there were some stark differences that we saw through COVID that really were systemic in society already or in the economy that COVID really took to another level. And then the other reason that we've built this presentation is to get policymakers to focus on three solution areas from an economic development standpoint. There are some issues with racism, um, with xenophobia that we're not gonna be able to address as business leaders, but there are some strategies we need to embrace today. So what I wanna do over the next few minutes is share with you a lot of statistics. If you love statistics, this is your kind of presentation. If not, you might wanna click over and surf the web for a few minutes. Uh, here as we unpack some of these numbers. So we're going to share screen. If we can think we're ready to share screen. All right. So let me share with you some numbers and I want to kind of start with some of the discrepancies and inequalities and disparities we saw during COVID-19. But let me begin by giving you an outlook of the next, you know, 30 years in Georgia. Uh, in 2020, uh, as we sit here today, we're just under 11 million people in the state of Georgia. Um, but within the next 10 years, we're going to be a state of almost 12 and a half million people. And we will be squarely a majority minority state by 2030, if not maybe a couple years before. I think the last election showed us that we're definitely a quote unquote purple state. I don't see the demographics shifting to the point that we're a solid blue state or a solid red state anymore but really a swing state for the next probably 20 to 30 years. Now, by 2030, a couple of other numbers I think are worth mentioning. One, 20% of the population of Georgia will be senior citizens by 2030. And in fact, 20, uh, most of our rural communities will be at least 25% uh, uh, senior citizens. That's gonna have a huge impact on you, the people you work for, our cities, our counties, and how to provide services for a very different senior population than we've ever had before in Georgia. Also, if you live in the Atlanta area, you're gonna have a million and a half more cars on the road by 2030. So if you think traffic's bad now, just hang on, uh, which I think drives home a whole nother conversation that I love to have is on freight and logistics and infrastructure investment. So my only takeaway here is please invest in infrastructure in your communities. It's desperate and we're gonna need it. Now, by 2040, I know most of us will hopefully be retired by then, but you're going to be a state somewhere between 13 and 15 million Georgians, 52% non-white population at that point. So we've, we've moved from basically 50.1% to adding about 2% over those 10 years. But here's a number that really is, is, I think, important. You're going to add a million more Latinx residents just in Atlanta alone. That's not statewide. It's a million more just in Atlanta. So you look at that economic growth, a third of our population growth over the next 23, 20 years are going to be uh, Latino Hispanic. So again, changing um, cultures, changing our state every single day. And then by 2050, we're squarely at probably 50 million people. I will say the early census numbers showed that our population growth in Georgia has slowed just a bit. Uh, but when you look at our economic growth, I think you're gonna see, particularly with some announcements coming here in the next few weeks, kind of a, an uptick probably starting next year in the population growth numbers again. So little, little you know, structure for where we are today. Let's look at the, the COVID-19 impact to the economy, not just in Georgia. I'm gonna share with you some national numbers and some Georgia numbers, but I will tell you, the national numbers mirror Georgia's number. And I just use national because give you a better context. Let's start with unemployment. Um, if you are a high wage worker uh, in 2020, uh, you were in higher demand. You actually probably made more money. Uh, the world looked really good. We actually increased employment by about six and a half percent of those folks that had, you know, those higher end wage earners, higher end degree holders. If you were in that mid range, area era of uh, wage coming in, you saw a decrease of about one and a half percent. Not too bad uh, within the fluctuations of a normal economic downturn, but really those people at the bottom of our economic ladder, 
those are the ones that got hurt the worst. Almost 20% unemployment for those men and women that are in our, our hourly wage earners, our fast food, our retail, our hospitality sectors, they really got hurt the worst. We're gonna talk about these numbers again in a moment. I wanna show you another statistics to break that down. But there's one group in here that I think is worth noting, uh, and that's Generation Z. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, Gen Z are our young men and women that are in high school today, like my son, all the way through kids that are about 24, 25 years old, so just coming into the workforce. If you take all of those men and women that were in the workforce in February of last year, half of them lost their jobs. Half of them. Now, think about this from a generational standpoint. What does this do to your psyche if your first job, you lost it uh, within a year or two of starting that job? And if half of your friends lost their job? This is on, on with thinking about how the greatest generation changed after the psychological impact of the Depression and World War II. I think we're going to be dealing with the remnants of this psychological impact for the next 10 to 20 years. One early study showed us that Gen Z's, because of this, will be less likely than millennials to job uh, hop, that they're more likely to stay grounded into a job and more likely to to stay in their communities where they grew up to be more attracted to rural communities and more stable economic environments. And so don't want to spend a lot of time on that today, but it's definitely worth you tracking and following to understand. And also remember, Generation Z is the most diverse generation we've ever had in human history. Now, a couple of other areas of economic impact to, to think about. We lost about 50% of demand for office space in this country, including here in Georgia. Uh, we don't know how that's going to come back. A lot of the support jobs for office jobs are held by minorities, by women, uh, by Latinos. They're being hurt literally as a, as a one-off because of this impact. We lost half of our hospitality jobs last year. About 30% of those jobs are still gone. I talked to a hotel just last week in middle Georgia, who said right now they only hired back 5% of their total employees, 5%. And we're now, what, a, almost a year to date to the first cases of COVID. Those are, those are tough impacts there. And then retail, uh, again, lower skill jobs have really decimated. In 2019, I gave a talk and I told people that there were more retail closures in America and in Georgia in 2019 than in 2015, 16, 17, and 18 combined. And that the impact of Amazon and online retail was coming on fast and furious and we should really expect to lose 100,000 retail establishments in America by 2030. Well, look at 2020, uh, almost 9,000 retail closures. Uh, and then this year projected, as we come out of COVID, 10,000 more retail closures. So that 100,000 that we were going to lose by 2030, we're probably going to lose it by 2025. Uh, online, everything, the internet of everything is changing retail. And these are jobs typically held by younger workers, disadvantaged workers, lower skill workers that are going to be impacted again and again and again as we move through COVID. The other group that was disproportionately impacted by COVID are really our small businesses, right? Let me frame these three statistics for you. If you look at Georgia's small business growth, you know which demographic was the fastest growing for business startups? It was actually Hispanic female entrepreneurs, followed closely by African-American female entrepreneurs. Sad thing is both those groups, so they're generating a, a disproportionate share of new companies, they also have a disproportionate share of fail, business failures, which we'll talk about in a moment. So here are the three statistics. We had a 31% decrease in small business revenue in Georgia last year, 31% less businesses opened last year than in a normal year. Good news was the, uh, Governor Kemp, our economic development men and women like you, the Department of Economic Development, we're able to bring in a lot more larger companies that have actually helped our employment grow. Um, great news statistics, Georgia had the fourth lowest total job loss in 2020 of any other state. 
And in the fourth quarter, we had the second highest job growth. So while our small businesses have suffered, our larger companies have done quite well. Again, those higher wage earner companies. What worries me the most is the impact though to minority owned businesses. 41% of black owned businesses closed during COVID. Most of those haven't reopened. Now, nationwide and in Georgia, we lost about 22% of all businesses closed at some point. Most of those have reopened now. I think we're still probably around 20% of restaurants and 30% of uh, bars haven't reopened, but generally business has been able to come back. If you're not reopened by now, you're not gonna reopen. That's just the sad state of the situation. But we also know that minority owned small businesses are the best way to move a family out of generational poverty. The research is there all day long to show if you can start your own business, you have a whole new career path and opportunity for you out there and for your kids and their kids. And so when we take out almost 50% of those men and women that were pulling themselves out of poverty into a better world, we really set ourselves back and the economy is set back. So some, some pretty severe numbers there for us to think about. And then I've got one more I wanna share with you here from COVID. That unemployment number I, I shared with you a moment ago, um, you know, 18% low wage workers. If we look at all unemployment for 2020, particularly during the, the main COVID period, white unemployment was around 13%, highest that we've had uh, since the Great Recession, recession actually a little bit higher. But guys, look at black unemployment, 17%. Uh, Latino unemployment was 19%. If you look at black female unemployment, it was almost 20%. One out of every five black women that was working in this country lost their jobs last year. If these numbers don't clearly show you the disparity that exists systemically in the economy, COVID put a magnifying glass on it for all of us to take a look at. So if we can, it's hard these days to agree on anything, right? But if we can agree that these numbers show a bigger problem within the economy, then what do we do to try to counter it? So let me share with you kind of our focus here at the chamber. We've done a lot of research in this area, particularly with the Gates Foundation and with the Zuckerberg Foundation and, and other partners over the last six years. And what we've found are there are three key things for economic prosperity, mobility, and empowerment if we want to help people grow and become um, you know, more engaged in economic opportunity. The first is human capital. That's the education component. And I want to unpack this in a moment for you. The second one is access to financial capital. Having the dollars, I'll use the example of just starting your own business, right? So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. And then the third area is, if you've got the education that you need and there's a quality there, if there's a quality in financial capital access, then the missing link is your ability to plug into greater networks, just like we've got with GMA, like we have with our Chambers of Commerce. So let me share with you uh, to try to frame up these issues a little bit more here. Because I think this is where we start looking at state policy recommendations. It's where local chambers and economic developers, city leaders, county leaders, start looking at what they can do to help those businesses and that minority population grow and become more prosperous. So let's start with human capital. Now, we can look at a ton of different data out here, but there's a couple of data points that I think really illustrate the issue that we've got. We know, studies show that if you get a college education or that technical de degree, you have a much higher propensity to be successful long-term, either starting your own business or in working your way through your jobs. Well, some of the research we do show that our kids aren't even getting the opportunity to get to college because they're not even taking the SAT. 70% of all students in Georgia took the SAT last year. That's 44% of white students, 32% of black students, and only 11% of Latinx students. Part of the problem, a couple of issues here, right? First of all, we're not having, we don't have enough counselors in our schools to help kids understand how to apply, how to take these tests. Number two, we're giving these tests usually on Saturdays at some school that takes you 45 minutes to drive to you don't have a car to get there. 
much less can your parents take off work to drive you there? Can you afford to take off work, right? And so we've made recommendations to the General Assembly uh, this year, last year and again this year to increase funding for the number of um, high school counselors. Did you know today that the average high school counselor is one counselor per 868 students? Now, I'm not great at math, but you try to divide that out and tell me how much time can a counselor really give to one out of 186 students? So we've got to fix that. And we've also got to allow kids to take the SAT in their own classroom during a school day. That's easy to do. My son's school just did that last two weeks ago. If we can do it, every school in Georgia ought to be able to do it. And we've asked the General Assembly to give our school systems that opportunity to do it. So we've got to make sure that we're giving kids an equal starting point if we want them all to have the same equal opportunity to success. The second area that we've spent a lot of time looking at is once we get our kids in college, what's the magic ingredient for them to be successful? And all the research says you can be in class all day long, take all the classes you want, but you need the real world experience, which means you need internships and be able to work. Well, look at what the numbers show, guys. If you look at all the paid internships in this country, 74% go to white students, 8% go to Latinx students, Asian students get 5% of all internships, but black students only get 6%. Now, you can, you can do the disproportionate back out of those numbers, and it clearly shows we've got a problem. I've talked recently with the heads of some of our HBCUs, and one of them made the point, I thought it was so powerful. He said, I'm sitting here with some of the best and the brightest that I've ever seen, and I look across the highway, and I can see the names on the sides of buildings, of the companies where my kids want to go work, but I can't even get them an internship interview there. Right there, guys, is an opportunity for your local businesses, for your companies, to work on paid internships and really focus on diversity of giving these young men and women equal opportunity. The third area, and I'm not going to bore you with a slide on it, that um, I think is critically important is making sure that our school systems have entrepreneur education and financial literacy education for all so that every student out there gets the same opportunity to understand how to keep a checkbook, how to balance your budget, but also how to start your own business. I love the fact that Georgia Tech, that every single student that enrolls at Georgia Tech has to take a class on how to start their own business. Doesn't matter if you're an English major or whatever, you're gonna take that class. And that's why Georgia Tech has one of the highest startup rates of any, um, uh, school in the country. So we've got to focus on this human capital and equality of educational attainment. Next, we've got to focus on equality of financial capital access. And I know this one's a little harder to read, but let me just get you a couple of high points here. If you look at all the venture funds in America last year, 77% went to white startups, 1.3% went to Latinx startups, but only 1.1% went to black startups. Now, you say, well, Chris, maybe only 1% were black startups. No, that's not true. Uh, the numbers were, were much more dynamic. Now, the only good news in this is that female-owned startups did increase from 7 to 11% last year in their percentage of access to venture capital. But we've got to do more work here. One of the recommendations that, that we've seen gain momentum in some communities is the creation of your own venture firms locally. You want small businesses to start up, work with your banks, work with some donors, set it up so that every business has access out there. Access to capital is important, but also make sure that they've got mentors to help them be successful. Home ownership is another critical um, pointer to whether or not someone's gonna have financial success. 73% of, of whites in Georgia own their own home. Only 48% of Latinxes and only 44% of black uh, Georgians own their own homes, have a mortgage. Here's the, here's the issue. You say, well, what does that have to do with business? If you go to the bank to start your own company, you got to have collateral. Well, if I don't already have a relationship or a house, I'm also disadvantaged to be able to get a business loan. Most small businesses start up use their house as, um, as collateral. So, all right, Chris, well, I want to go to the bank then and get a small business loan. Great. 
18% of white businesses were able to get bank loans last year, but only 1% of black owned businesses. Again, our, our minority communities in Georgia and in the country are underbanked. They are underbanked. That's why I'm proud when I see Wells Fargo and Synovus and Regions and Truist and others put out new programs specifically targeted to minority business owners to try to help them grow. Credit card funding, listen, let me tell you something. You don't wanna fund your startup on a credit card, but look at the numbers there. Only 10% of white businesses use credit cards to start up, 12.5% of Latinx, but 17, almost 20% of black owned businesses are using credit cards. Now, I don't know about y'all, I, I don't, it's been a long time since I looked at my credit card interest rate. Usually it's around 12 to 18% back in the good old days when I watched it. You'll never pay that off. And that's another problem for us out there. And then obviously, lack of health insurance is a huge, huge problem across our communities. And again, if you don't have access to health care, gosh, it's awfully hard for you to focus on growing your business. So if we can focus on addressing equality in education and in human capital, we can better bank and have different avenues for revenue access within financial capital. Then the next area is to build our social capital networks, to think differently here. Um, you know, one of the things I'm proud of at the Georgia Chamber that we've done is three years ago, we signed an agreement with the Georgia Hispanic Chambers of Commerce to come in as our affiliate so we can reach out and be a representative of Latino owned businesses in Georgia, as well as every other business that's a member. And last week I signed an agreement with the Atlanta Black Chambers to bring them in to make sure that we're representing their constituents as well too. Same reason that we've opened two offices in rural Georgia to make sure that we're representing all parts of the state. So we need you at the local level to think about all the different networks of individuals that connect with each other in order to facilitate business growth. This list, as beautiful as the flower is, is not comprehensive. But go to any civic club. When you go to your Rotary Club to speak or to just go have fried chicken on Mondays, how many minorities are there and part of that club? What about the Kiwanis Club, the Optimist Club? Your Chambers of Commerce. I spoke recently at a Chamber of Commerce. There's 100 people in the room. It's a very diverse community. There's one African American in the whole room. Our chambers have to do a better job of reaching out and being inclusive and being welcoming. How do you train leadership? You know, it's interesting, and I've, I'm a proponent of leadership training, youth leadership training. The problem with youth leadership programs in Georgia is that they're mainly geared to the top 10% of your high school kids who are gonna grow and go somewhere and be successful no matter what you do. You're ignoring the C and D students that are probably gonna stay in your community, be productive, great citizens, and could be more if you gave them a little help. And then your leadership programs, as much as I love and come to speak to some of your local leadership programs every year, I look out in the audience and they are overwhelmingly white. Uh, we do a poor job of recruiting in and diversifying those leadership groups. We encourage businesses and government alike to look at their supplier networks to make sure that there's opportunities for minority owned businesses. I, I, it's a great story. There's a new arena being built in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I was briefed last week on it's an exciting project. And I love the fact that the private sector working with the city government said, we're gonna set aside and have and ensure that these contracts, a certain percentage of contracts will come from companies within this community. We're not gonna go get them somewhere else, we're not gonna go get them out of state, we're gonna get them here. And we're gonna have a special effort to help minority start up to get working here with us. I also think we have to think about our faith community differently. Um, I love my faith community in Fayette County. We work together, we, don't, we try not to duplicate, uh, but we need more of that work. And so too often, I think elected leaders uh, economic developers, chambers, we think of the faith community in a different bucket and we don't always reach out to them. But they are doing great and important work and that gives us a new way to diversify and to reach underrepresented groups. Local government, you guys are on the ground. You have so much opportunity uh, to bring people along, to bring people together, to facilitate it. And then lastly, you know, we continue to encourage corporate boards to diversify uh, their own efforts out there. I think that's vitally, vitally important. So one more slide for you, and then I'm gonna shut up and answer questions. From a business standpoint, I think you could probably apply this to government as well. When you do have a diverse workforce, 
you see the results. This, was, this is research done by Deloitte, and I think it tells such a great story. If you have a diverse, inclusive organization, you're two times more likely to exceed your financial, you're three times more likely to be high performing, your business outcomes are gonna improve almost times 10. Numbers don't lie. You know, I've used that a lot lately, I don't know about y'all, through uh, our election process, but you can disagree on a lot of things, but the numbers, as my son said, math, lie, dad, numbers are what they are. And so we know that being diverse, being inclusive, helping people, growing people, moving toward empowerment, all have real impacts. So we're, we'd love to come into your community, talk to your chambers, talk to any groups out there, share these numbers. We've actually been able to lead some communities on some pretty difficult conversations about race. I've been in one of your communities where we had, you know, 300 people in a, in a, a high school gym. 150 people on one side were all African American. 150 people on the other side were all white. And they literally did not sit together. And we had to lead them through a dialogue and a discussion about the issues that they face. Um, and so we'd, we'd love to work with you all on that. And same with that, I'll stop and, and open it up for questions. And I know I covered a lot really quickly. Chris, thank you so much. That was fantastic information. Um, and we do have a couple minutes for questions. If you wanna throw some questions in the chat, we're, we'll be we'll happy to um, address those. I just ask everybody to go easy. I'm in the middle of a legislative session too, so don't, don't ask me too tough of questions. Uh, this presentation uh, is recorded, so it'll also be available on the GeorgiaCities.org found, GeorgiaCitiesFoundation.org website um, shortly. All right, I don't know that we got any more questions out I there, think that Stephanie. We do. So That's such an you, easy group. Oh, here we go. Um, sometimes it takes a minute to get to okay. get them come through. Uh, does Georgia Chamber have a curriculum or handbook that can be used by communities to start discussions on diversity? So we, we don't have a handbook. What we like to do is actually have the conversation directly with you because every community is different. I've found some that it was good enough and it worked well enough for us to set up a task force and to build it out that way. Others, we have to go through a very slow process. So every community is different. We don't. Um, I would recommend uh, you go to our website, gachamber.com, on our diversity and inclusion page. We do have resources. The MLK Center does some great work. Uh, there's a great workshop that's being developed by the Human Rights Museum here in town uh, that can come in and facilitate this. And I'll tell you another great, great way to start this conversation is to reach out to Todd Gross at the Georgia Historical Society and ask Todd or one of his team members to come and talk about the history of race in your community. They can frame this issue historically to tell you exactly what the world was like, how we got to where we are today. It is a powerful, powerful discussion. I, I kind of focus on where we're going. Todd really focuses on where we've been. So I'd encourage you to reach out to him too, but go to our website and look at the, that resource page there. Um, let's see if I've got anything else. Cool. Everybody's too busy trying to recruit companies to their towns and help jobs grow. So, a couple questions. Oh, yeah, go for it, Chris. Um, we have one question. So, would it be useful for municipalities to analyze their awarded contracts or even their vendors to see what proportion went to yeah. um, maybe this is supposed to say minorities, minority owned businesses? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I, 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 I think, Chris, I think any major disparities. This is a tricky space because of the rules surrounding procurement. Yeah, so Chris, I do think that's the kind of data that, that you're gonna need at some point. So I do think, you know, all of our governments should be looking at it. I would encourage local governments, if you're serious about this, think about it from the, from the same context of a Home Depot or a Coca-Cola, right? They actually set up a program to, um, nurture and groom and support minority suppliers. I mean, it is a whole big deal. There's somebody in charge of it. They're not setting aside quotas necessarily, which I know is difficult for, for you know, governments to do that, but they're actually saying, we're gonna commit to helping you grow to learn what businesses we need. 
if you're close but you don't quite qualify, how can we you there? Maybe your bonding is not strong enough and that's why you can't qualify for some of our work. How can we help pool your bonds? Companies are being very proactive about it. And I think, you know, governments, are, I think there's lessons to be learned there from the corporate sector. Um, one last one and then we'll wrap up. Um, do you have any resources specifically for nonprofit arts organizations uh, or ways to adapt for us? I, I don't. Uh, I haven't been asked that question before. Um, but quite frankly, I don't know what the difference would be between any other nonprofit and an arts organization. I mean, if you know, you, you're gonna have to have some of the same hard discussions, real strategies, but no matter what organization you're in, you have to have a heart for listening if you want to have these conversations and you can't take things personal, can't have thick skin. Uh, you have to really be vulnerable and say, I'm, I'm willing, I care enough to have this conversation. And I'm not going to wait for you to come to me. I'm going to actually go to you on your turf and have a conversation. Now, it might not go great. It might not solve all your problems, but you start and you develop a trust that long term. And, you know, and maybe part of this discussion, too, is you're having a discussion with your own organization. We've done that here at the chamber. It was brutal. Uh, there were people crying, hugging. Um, we had conversations start that we never had before, but it's a process and you've got to start it somewhere. But uh, the longer you wait, I think the further behind you fall. Uh, and many of you out there, like in the arts, you're going to look for grants and donors. Those grants and donors are going to demand that you have a diversity and inclusion effort and that they can see it, that it's in writing, that it's part of your DNA. So you got you to start somewhere, but I'd encourage you just to, to go listen to each other and accept that you've maybe screwed up and hadn't done the job you need to do before. Um, we can all do better in this area. And the last bit of recommendation I, I beg of you, if it's at the community level, in your own organization, many of you are gonna think about putting together a task force or a committee to work on these issues. Here's, so from one of my members, he, he explained it to me this way. His company, a big, huge national company, set up a DNI committee within the company to help nurture employees to move them through the corporate ladder. And they had a, a steering committee. And he said the problem was the steering committee were all people that looked alike, that the white people in the organization didn't engage in the DNI discussion at all. They felt it wasn't for them or maybe they weren't welcome. But the truth is those were the men and women that were making the decisions. So everyone has to be at this table, young, old, black, white, Latina, everybody has got to be represented at that table if you want success. Fantastic. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been incredible and such great information and very relevant to what we're doing in our Georgia Economic Placemaking Collaborative. Um, uh, we practice place-based economic development, and as you know, that's a bottom-up process, and it's rooted in equity and inclusion. So thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our retreat. Um, once again, this presentation is recorded and will be available on the GeorgiaCitiesFoundation.org website. Um, this concludes our first day of retreat. Thank you so much for attending, and we will see you tomorrow.